Hey guys, thanks very much for staying on there. I've got the very last shift of the weekend, so uh, much appreciated. I hope that I'll reward you for, uh, for your attention. Um, I'm going to plough straight in with a couple of questions for you. Um, not sure if you're aware of the kind of the government recommendations on certain healthy living, um, behaviour change type uh, information campaigns. But just a quick question, quick raise of hands from, from my audience here. Did you complete five times 30 minutes of physical activity in the last week, do you think? If you did, hand in the air. Okay. This comes with no judgment. That's okay. Does that, that, does walking count? Uh, yeah, and then to be brisk walking at moderate intensity, <laughs> moderate intensity is going to elevate your heart rate, bring out a slight perspiration, but you will still be able to hold a conversation, so I know, I, yeah. Um, who had five, five fruit and vegetables yesterday? Okay, a few hands going up a little bit slower because I would imagine you're probably thinking, what day is it? What day was it yesterday? What did I do yesterday? Of course, you were probably here yesterday, what did I have for my breakfast and so on. It actually takes just a moment for us to work these things out. Um, did you consume more than two or three units of alcohol in one day in the past week? And that is actually two units for the ladies and it's three units for the gentlemen. Okay, again, this comes to no judgment. Um, I understand there were some drinks here last night, so perhaps a little bit mean of me to put that question in. Um, what about this one? Did you consume more than six grams of salt yesterday? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really tough one, isn't it? I actually have no idea how much salt I consume. Uh, I could sit here and I could chat about the benefits of a, a lower salt diet. Um, I could talk about foods and things that you could swap from one to the other and uh, foods that have got hidden salt in, etc. But none of us are walking, talking, grammar salt calculating robots. Uh, yet, you've probably heard the the six grams of salt. If you go onto the Food Standards Agency website, there's a list of you know top ten tips for uh, a great diet, and something like number six is make sure you don't have more than six grams of salt. And as far as I'm concerned, it's like the laziest form of health improvement message that is out there, um, because most of us haven't got a clue, and I certainly don't. Um, I was doing a piece of work in Manchester just recently, and uh, at lunchtime, one of the directors took me to the canteen, and he picked up very proudly this leaflet that he had, and. It was about uh, the six gram salt campaign and it was all very bright, it was pink, it was got a pretty little heart in it. And it said, did you know 26 million people in Britain consume too much salt every day? And, um, uh, and I assume that's probably based on someone has estimated it's about half of adults in the UK consume too much salt. Uh, so it was a very crude kind of number. And then it went on about the, uh, the possible health risks and so on. And, but he thought it was great and I said, well, the problem is, of all your canteen, there isn't much out here that says what's low salt, what's high salt. Uh, it's great that you have this, um, this leaflet and it looks very attractive. However, so do you think you fall into the category of people, are you one of those 26 million, who did have too much salt? And he goes, I don't know. I said, are you worried, if you, if you were in that group, are you worried? And he said, no, not really. Because I guess 26 million people did <coughs> drop dead yesterday. Um, equally, I said, be honest now, if you're not in that group of 26 million people, are you worried about the 26 million people who are? And he said, no, not really. Again, it's just a, another example of a number that's thrown out there that we don't really have ready access to. We don't know where we're starting from, so we don't really know where we're going with it. And to be honest, we don't care because we're not afraid enough of the consequences. Do we all use one of these? I won't need to have a show of hands on this one. Do we use one of those? Have a fuel gauge in your car if you drive? Yeah. Good with numbers? No? I, mean, I can remember the phone numbers at the houses where I grew up, at my grandma's house, because she hasn't moved for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't remember my mum's mobile phone number. She's had it about five years. I just know what it ends in. Because we've worked out that we're really bad at remembering numbers, so we have, in the same way as with the alarm clocks and the fuel gauges, we've built tools that will help us get through the day. Um, because we recognise, perhaps on a subconscious level, that we're human and that we push our luck sometimes. If we didn't have these things, we'd oversleep, we'd run out of fuel, we'd be standing at the side of the road in the rain, um, running along to a nearby uh, telephone box, because we, we've, kind of we've arranged telephones and gadgets and tools, devices and things around us to help us deal with our humanness. However, when it comes to behaviour change, it's still really interesting that if we could call it UK Public Health Limited, whatever you want, you know, the public health engine in the UK, still relies very much on this idea of sort of internal willpower. We'll just give you a bit of information, and if you can't interpret it, uh, and you're, if you're not determined enough, you haven't got enough motivation, if you're not good enough, well then, um, you know, there's not an awful lot we can do about that. We can only just keep on giving you the information. 
I spent a little bit of time working in local government and the NHS, uh, and it kind of drove me mad, really, this uh, very robotic view that we had of people. Uh, and every two years, in England and Wales, we go out there with a survey and we ask people about their health behaviours and we say, do you, do you do enough exercise, how much fruit and veg do you eat, do you smoke, do you drink, etc. Um, and the data always comes back, I don't know why I'm so shocked every time, it's about a third, two thirds, it's about two thirds of people doing what we don't want them to and about a third of people doing what we do. Um, and they say, wow, they, they obviously don't know that they should have to find portions of fruit and veg. So, um, so we create a new leaflet and we a new banner and we stand in another supermarket uh, and we do this kind of whole five day campaign. Two years later we go out to the population and we ask them again, the numbers are exactly the same. In fact, not only that, but um, people don't really like admitting that they're a lost cause. So it's probably a bit worse than that. If you ask someone how many portions of fruit and veg they have and they have none, they'd probably tell you that they had two or three a day. They don't want you to think they're, they're a complete lost cause. Um, so some of this data self-reported is a bit fudged as well. Um, and it's not because people don't know. It's because life gets in the way and the sort of robotic view of human beings doesn't really suit us anymore. Um, I went to the uh, Blackpool Tower Ballroom. In fact, I went there about a year ago, but I also went back a couple of weeks. It hasn't changed at all. Uh, I'm one of these people that picks up leaflets and stuff. Just I'm a bit of a geek like that. Uh, and I picked up this brochure while I was there last year and it said, did you know there are over 30,000 floor tiles on the dance floor of the Blackpool Tower Ballroom? Uh, and it sounds obviously very grand and impressive. Um, but apart from the fact that I've shown you a picture here, it doesn't really give you any context because if I was just to say there are 30,000 floor tiles on the floor of the Blackpool Tower Ballroom, obviously that gives you a great idea how big the ballroom is, doesn't it? But of course there's a, there's a piece of information mission, missing that you know, and that is how big is a tile, right? Tiles are about so big, about a foot long, five, six inches wide. So now that you know how big a tile is, you're going to be pretty clear now on how big a pattern of 30,000 of those spread out is going to look like. It gets really difficult to visualise. Uh, you know, I'm, I've picked up a brochure that says 10,000 people in Wales every year die from coronary heart disease. My first thought, a bit like the 26 million people is, that's a lie because it's a really round number. You know, it might be 10,313, but if it was, they'd say, did you know that more than 10,000 people every year die? Uh, in Wales from coronary heart disease. I mean, is that a lot? There's about <coughs> 3 million people in Wales. So I suppose relatively it's not so bad, but we've got a very high population of older people. Certainly in North Wales, it's a great retirement place. I mean, you know, we're getting really good at curing people of stuff. They've got to die of something. You know, is it, is it a lot? Is it not? Is it 10,000 people sounds a lot, but then if they said 70,000, I think I'd feel exactly the same. And if they said 70 people, I think I would feel exactly the same again. It's a, it's, it's a number that doesn't give me a lot of context. It doesn't make me feel anything. I can't imagine them all standing there in a line. Um, Andrew Lansley, who was health secretary till recently, produced a, a document earlier this year. And it was all about the obesity epidemic in the UK. And he said 5 billion calories extra per day consumed in England and Wales. I mean, that really makes you feel something, doesn't it? I mean, that made the headlines. 5 billion calories. Do you know what that looks like? <laughs> I have no idea what 5 billion calories looks like. I actually tried to work this out in bags of sugar. Okay, bags, in bags of sugar, 5 billion, uh, 5 billion calories would fill the lift shaft of one of the, uh, uh, the Empire State Building, just one single lift shaft. I was hoping it would be something much grander than that, I actually try and fill the Empire State Building itself. But once I worked out what the, the floor dimensions of the Empire State Building were, it was only going to come up to about this high, and that's a really rubbish thing to visualise. Um, but you can't imagine the lift shaft of the Empire State Building filled with sugar. And what you definitely can't imagine is the 40 mile long queue of British people turning up with a spoon and a cup saying, I'd like to have my share, please. <laughs> it gets, it's not personalised information. The reality is it's about, it's about chocolate digestive a day per person. Okay, so suddenly now you can contextualise that and bring that into your, your day to day lives. It doesn't mean you, you're going to eat that less or next time you see one you're going to resist it. But at least you can contextualise the data. The other really funny thing about that report was he basically said, we're eating too much and we're not moving enough, which was kind of obvious. But the reaction that that provoked was, was exactly that. There were people coming up saying, we've spent a fortune on this report, and it's the bleeding obvious. And I wanted to ask the question, and that was, what on earth else did you think it was going to say? You know, they, they, they thought there was going to be some kind of magic ingredient come out in this report. Um, but we, we have these numbers, and then we compound them, we say, but how many thousands of people die from this? Um, and how you can reduce your risk of developing this by so many percent if you only 
for example, increase your physical activity by five times 30 minutes, moderate intensity, and so on. You have to be in a very calm, rational place, probably with a calculator, uh, to actually work out what that means. And I believe that if we work out what it means, sometimes we'll just push our luck. Um, again, it, it's just, it's mismatching numbers and it doesn't mean anything. And what we don't want to know is what does it mean to us personally? You'll probably be very familiar with the System 1, System 2, I heard reference to Daniel Kahneman earlier. Um, we're basically in the UK busy selling public health to the 5% part, the rational part of the brain. Uh, we're probably giving people just a little bit too much logical information for why they would want it. And that's the basic question that I, I, I try and use um, the organisations that I work with, and that is the why would you question. You know, it's, uh, it's okay to give us all this data, it's okay to tell us all the risks, the nasty things, the future stuff. Uh, why would you want to do it? If you were trying to persuade me to do something, why would I? Um, the reality is that most behaviour change, the why would you, comes into this category here. Most people make a decision to change a behaviour because of how they feel at 10 o'clock at night when they're getting undressed and they've got a lack of energy, the kids are still screaming and uh, they want to know quite how they ended up in this position. They want to quit smoking because they went to kiss a girl that they've been trying to date for ages and she recoiled and went, ugh, you smell like an ashtray. It's usually a completely emotional response rather than a, you know, I picked up a leaflet the other day at my doctor's and it said something I haven't heard before and I think it's a really good idea, I'll start tomorrow. Um, and the marketers know this too, when you, if you watch any, or well, pretty much all, um, UK commercials advertising on TV, it's very emotionally driven. Uh, this is a still from a Radox ad, um, you can probably guess that just by looking at it in, in one go. Uh, they don't tell you that you know, the, in every 500ml bottle there's about 30 bath balls, you, know, you can measure this out very conveniently with our 20ml cap, uh, but you might prefer to have it uh, a little stronger than that, it smells of flowers and it will get you clean. They don't bullet point the benefits in this kind of way. They paint a picture, they play sounds, music and imagery that makes you think that you need this product because it will help your, your worries melt away. In fact, not only that, but the moment you saw this, the men in the room as well as the ladies, you actually became that person just for a split second. Uh, those things in your mind that uh, help you empathise with other people, the things that will have you sitting on the sofa during the World Cup, weaving and bobbing, thinking that for some reason a little throwing of your weight over to the left is going to help that header knock that goal in several thousand miles away. Those uh, neurons that you have in your mind that, that do that actually fired up when you saw this picture. In your mind, you became that person and you thought that was a really great, luxurious, comfortable bath that I just have. I haven't got any radox in at home, so I'm going to have to get some on the way. So this is uh, the way that they, uh, they present this stuff. Um, so my first point that I'm making, the, the, the why would you question, is that uh, certainly, say, when it comes to health improvement behaviour change, People want to make a change, they have a fire of motivation lit under them because they feel something and it's an emotion and it's applied to them personally. Uh, it's not, uh, you can, uh, we have this uh, amazing services, this is what you can access from us uh, and so on. And it's about how it makes people feel rather than the, uh, the list of numbers and so on. Okay, there is, a, there is another principle at play here. Um, we operate in one of two modes, we're either in investment mode or in experience mode. Um, I probably don't need to uh, use our experience uh, conference to uh, spend too much describing the two. Um, perhaps just a little story that says, you know, I've been working really hard this week, this week's been extra long, of course, it's a Saturday. Uh, when I get home tonight, just as a reward for all my hard work, um, we're going to enjoy a nice relaxing evening. First thing we're going to do is put up the spare, uh, the wardrobes in the spare room. We've got these IKEA wardrobes, I have them about six months and uh, we haven't quite, quite got around to putting them up yet, so we're going to do those first, then we're going to get a DVD out of the collection, pack that, we'll kick back and relax. Which probably doesn't really sound like much of a treat or a reward, or you think I lead a very odd lifestyle. Um, the tension in the statement is, of course, because what I've done is I've described two types of investment behaviour. Investment behaviour is where you, you plan, you work, it's all very deliberate, it's very future thinking. Uh, putting up wardrobes, for example, is investment behaviour. It's pretty painful while you're doing it, but you know that it'll be good when it's done, and hopefully they won't collapse within a couple of weeks. It's an investment, it's a long-term thing. Uh, if I was really to say what uh, um, I would want to do for, at the end of a hard week, it would be experience stuff. It'd be like, let's go out for dinner, let's go to the cinema, let's go out for a meal, let's go and get a facial or something like that. Um, experience behaviour is how you behave on holiday. It is, uh, you know, let's go and get another ice cream, let's just sit by the pool because we can, let's go for another day out, let's go for dinner, and so on. Um, so we operate in one of the two, we sort of flip-flop between them. Uh, here's a word cloud of investment behaviour. 
and the work hard of experienced behaviour, and it wouldn't take a genius in the room to work out which of these two that we're most um, attracted towards. This is the reason why we love buy now, pay later. If you think about the, um, the financial implications of a buy now, pay later deal, uh, you can go shopping for a new sofa, you can pick one that you like, uh, you can pay £25 a month every month for the next four years, and you get your sofa in four years' time. Or you pay £25 a month every month for the next four years, you get your sofa in two weeks' time. Guess which one a human animal would prefer? If, there's, if the financial penalty is exactly the same, we prefer to have the experience sooner rather than later. Um, but that kind of behaviour then kicks over into other areas of our health. Uh, so we make decisions, we think it's just another cigarette, it's just a, another unhealthy meal, it's just another evening on the sofa, I'll get around to doing that workout next week. So we do a lot of now behaviour and we think that we'll deal with the consequences in the future. So that's actually the buy now, pay later that we're doing with our good health. And this is how we're combating this in the UK and elsewhere. We're saying, do a little bit of this now, do it every day, do it consistently, and you too can enjoy a long-term uh, happy health in your retirement. So it's very much a savings model, uh, and it's about the most dull, uh, dull message that we could possibly give. And the terms and conditions are crap, because if this was real money, you wouldn't put your money anywhere near it. Uh, you have to be putting in consistently over a long period of time, and you might or might not get your money back, because some of these things, some of these illnesses and conditions happen to us anyway. And we've all got one of these. You know, there are plenty of people out there who think it's okay, I'll just push my luck when it all goes wrong, I'll just pop to hospital, they'll put me right, I'll have an operation, or they'll give me some pills or something, and it'll all go away again. So it's a bit like having a benevolent parent who just bails us out every time we hit the bottom of our credit card limit. This is what's at play here, hyperbolic discounting. It's this idea that people um, prefer the things they can have immediately over the things they can have in the future. Uh, so you'd say, surely, uh, a takeaway and a boozy night out tonight versus long-term good health. There is no contest. Long-term good health is far, far better than a single night of, uh, of indulgence. However, I can have my night of indulgence tonight. I might have to wait two decades before I, I get the benefit of my long-term good health. And that's where um, the, this, this problem compounds. So we're hardwired for short-term um, uh, over the long-term. So again, the UK Public Health saying, you know, what we need is you need to giving us all the numbers, and then telling us about the risks that we face for things that might happen to us a couple of decades in the future is kind of missing the point. We're also really poor at understanding risk. Um, probably, uh, I don't know if any of you are national lottery players. Anyone here play lottery? Uh, we heard a bit about online gambling and that before. Um, people who play the lottery really don't understand risk, and I play it, and it's kind of ridiculous. Um, that would do that. People take chances. People feel comfortable in their cars, but they don't feel comfortable doing other risky stuff. Um, we really have not actually a clue um, of, of risk and how that would impact on us. Here is a grid that shows you the relative risk of an active person and an inactive person for cancer. In fact, to be specific, a 20-year window of terminal cancer risk. There is a 1 in 16 chance uh, across the population this is. Uh, I know it would be broken down different demographics, but 1 in 16 average that you'll develop terminal cancer in a 20-year window. But if you're physically active at the government's recommended 150 minutes a week, um, then you can reduce that by 50%. Now, you know, if you happen to cut that first grid up and put it into a tombola, you wouldn't expect to draw a red. You'd expect to draw a white. I think if people really understood these risks, as long as they haven't been personally touched by this or they haven't had a friend who's drawn a red, uh, or, or a family member, I think if people really understood the risks, they would take their chance. I think if you were to say to somebody who wasn't active, who found the idea of turning up at their local leisure facility just a little bit scary because they think that what's in there is some out of the British Empire, you know, 40-year-olds in shorts w walking around with a tennis racket in one hand and a football under the other, going out to put the trampolines out and stuff. I think, you know, um, the barriers to participation are so big and the effort required, I mean, we say it's easy, it's not. Don't, don't be fooled, it's not. It requires a lot, of, a lot of sweat and a lot of effort and a lot of discomfort, some of this stuff. We're asking people to trade their time, their leisure time, to do stuff they don't really want to do, to reduce this grid by one square. I think if people really understood that, they would take the chance to sit down, have a cup of tea and watch EastEnders instead. We also have a um, self-serving bias, and that is that if we make poor decisions when we're young, we suffer when we're old, we'll say it's because we got unlucky. You know, everyone knew... Uh, a great uncle Bertie, he lived to be 96, he has whiskey for breakfast, he has pies and smokes 60 every day. Um, and they also know that every now and again a footballer or a, a health
healthy young run or something that will fall down, drop dead at the side of the road or, or something like that. So we're, we're, we're very, um, very mixed understanding of risk. And this is a tweet which um, shows this, some of these points in a really interesting way. This is from NHS Suffolk. NHS Suffolk, I don't know who does the tweet for them, I actually worship them personally. They were the ones that put out a tweet recently that said at, at the August bank holiday, do you seriously think you're going to die? If the answer to this question is no, then surely you shouldn't be presenting yourself at A&E for treatment this weekend. Which I kind of loved, but it was a little bit blunt. What it enabled them to do, though, is to have a conversation with journalists, because of course journalists picked it up and it ended up being blown out of proportion. So really, NHS Suffolk took one for the team. But um, they put this one out there, 29th of October last year. It was at 6 o'clock on a Saturday. Exactly 6 o'clock. So we all know there's nobody sitting there typing this stuff. They just prepared it on, on Friday afternoon. They thought, I'll take the tobacco box this weekend. And they put this really lazy comment out there. I think that if I happen to be a smoker and I happen to live in NHS Suffolk in their catchment area, um, and I happen to be on Twitter and I happen to follow them and I happen to be looking at 6 o'clock on a Saturday, because of course those of you on Twitter know that the, the feed's very active, um, I think if I saw that, I'd think, hmm, I haven't had a cigarette for a while. I think I'll pop out and have one. I don't <laughs> think I'm going to say, you know what, you're absolutely right, my very next cigarette might be the death of me. I now need to click on this short URL to find out how I'm going to save my own life. If you click on the short URL, because I was interested to see what amazing solution lay behind it, it starts by saying, did you know that 38,000 people every year in the UK die from lung cancer? Nine out of ten of those are smokers. And then it was a bit about... NHS Suffolk's policy and strategy on tobacco control and a message from their local director of public health. And by the time you got to the bottom of the page, because I did actually get there, how many leaps are we taking now? It says we've got this great team of people who can help you if you want to quit. That should have been right at the top. Um, I checked the app responses to this tweet, there were two. Uh, and both suggested that you might die because smoke would land on your head while you're outside having a cigarette. And one of those things was a stray NASA satellite, because on that weekend, last year, there was a bit of space junk flying around, but at some point over the weekend, it was likely to bounce back into the Earth's atmosphere uh, and land somewhere on our planet, probably out in the Pacific or something like that. Um, I'm not sure that the person who, re who sent the tweet back really believed that, but it's just, again, another example of our lack of understanding uh, of real risk. So people prefer certainty over... Um, something that's risky. So again, going back to that public health message, do this, start now, um, based on these numbers, um, and do it for, for a long period of time. You will reduce your risk, possibly, but it might happen to you anyway. Again, completely misses the point. Another thing is about human behaviour is that we, we want the things that we want far more than we want to avoid the things that we don't want. Going back to what I said about the lottery, the lottery is a small speculation in the hope of a great win. On the flip side, and actually a very similar sort of financial transaction, um, car insurance is a sadly not quite so small investment um, for the protection against a huge loss. Um, however, one of them feels really nice to do and the other one doesn't feel so good. Who in here would prefer to pay their car insurance over buying a lottery ticket? <laughs> so we... Uh, um, we're programmed to want the things that we want far more than that we want to avoid the things that we don't want. And in actual fact, the psychological implication of saying the only reason you could possibly want to change your diet or improve your activity levels or quit the, the binge drinking that you so enjoy, the only reason you could possibly think of wanting to do that is to avoid something really horrible. We're actually reinforcing the fact that the activity in itself, the behaviour change in itself, is a really hard and horrible thing to do. The only reason you could possibly want to do it is to avoid a greater evil. Here's a really good example, though, of um, a service up in Wigan. Uh, I always have to be careful how I say this. Drop a shirt size. Um, it's a weight loss service uh, aimed at gentlemen. It's football and rugby themed um, kind of education, although that makes it sound very dry. It's very dynamic stuff that they do. Uh, and they say to the gentleman that sign up, if you can lose 5% of your body weight in 12 weeks, we'll give you a brand new shirt to either Wigan Athletic, Wigan Warriors or Lee Centurions. So, free shirt of your choice that's probably about 40, 50 pounds worth um, of shirt. And you can have that for free if you can achieve this target that we set you. And we're going to keep it in theme and we're going to make it enjoyable. So, they're giving people what they want. The genius about this particular programme, though, is actually how they filled it up in the first place. Um, they set out a table on match day at Wigan Athletic and encouraged people, men obviously, who were coming to the game, to be weighed and measured in public. And you think there is no way that that would happen, except what they had was a box of programmes for the match. 
under the table. And what they said was any bloke that's brave enough to stand on that, stand under that, fill in a form, can have a free programme, which is worth a fiver. So you get your chap come to the game, he's got a fiver in his pocket, he was going to buy a programme with it. All he has to do is stand under that, stand on that, write some details, and now he's got a programme and his fiver with which he can go in now and he can buy a burger and a beer, which is perhaps an unintended consequence, but it's the reason that we... Um, the, the, we, the, the reason it was successful is because we were focused on what people actually wanted, and that was they wanted a programme. And we made it as pain-free as we could for them to be able to access it. What actually happened was they ended up with a queue. And you know what happens with a queue? Queues create curiosity, so people stood around to find out why there was a queue. And because people were standing around, people wanted to know what was all the fuss, and then they realised that there were other people um, doing this, and obviously it wasn't so bad. Um, and they wanted a programme too, that they did that. So that's how they harvested the information that led to fill in this programme. A little bit of genius because they focused on what people really wanted. Um, I don't know if you're aware of uh, an app on iPhone um, called Field Agent. It's something that I, I used to have. It's quite interesting. It's, um, it's like uh, distributing uh, market research or... Um, uh, how do I describe... Okay, an example is... Um, of a task that I carried out on, you know, the big prime site adverts. Uh, rather than the company themselves dispatching someone to go around the country and pick up, um, uh, do, do, do an assessment on each of these big prime site signs, what they did was they posted them out onto, onto this field agent thing on your app. You got notified there were new ones. And you could find a prime site sign maybe within a couple of miles of your house. You'd say, I'll do that job. And then you go there, you take a couple of photographs of it, you answer a few questions about the state of the framing and the posters and that you count up the little safety devices on the outside and uh, you check that the lights are on and stuff like that. And then you submit all the answers and, and it up, goes up to the internet and you actually get real money for it. So this one here, if I'd have done that, would have given me £4.50 into my PayPal account. So it's a great way, it's a cost effective way of people um, having a, like an army of people going out there and finding out how things are. It's a great way of me earning a few extra quid as well that I can spend for real money. Um, but the reason that I'm showing you this is a lot of services that we've got in the UK, um, they're very expensive, they're very time intensive. We've got weight loss services that cost over a £1,000 a family. Um, and they get the kids in, it's 10, 12 week programmes, and they, they do PowerPoints to parents over what is a portion of fruit and veg and stuff like that, and it just makes me want to scream. Um, sometimes the, the, the acid test you need to use is what would happen if we walked up on the roof of the town hall and just threw the money? Uh, out of the way, you know, what would be the, the, the impact of this, would it be better? And some of these services, they are seriously, they're so expensive. Um, what about a, t a technological solution that gives people what they want? If we said, we were going to spend a thousand pounds on you, um, we would like to sit down with you and decide how you'd like us to spend that on you, and in fact, we're going to then create your plan, we're, you're going to have an app, um, and every time you turn up at the leisure centre for a swim, you're going to get credited five pounds into your personal bank account. And in actual fact, as we go through the programme, if you've achieved a certain thing in 12 weeks' time, and then you come back to us in a further three months and you're still there, whatever money's left over, well, you can have that too. I think that would be far more interesting, persuasive, a way of getting people to do what we want them to do, just by giving them what, what they want rather than what they don't. Uh, I was up in Orkney just a week ago, and um, after I finished the session, I had about two hours spare before my flight home, so I walked into Kirtwall, and they got this really nice lake there by the marina, and a really pretty spot, and I, f I saw this, um, this big sign, it was all about walking routes around this marina, uh, and it was really nicely designed in that, but when you actually looked at the, the list of benefits for walking, the top one, it said, prevent disease. It was a really, really exciting, attractive phrase, that disease, isn't it? You know, the, the, the only reason, the why would you question that they answered was disease prevention, and then weight management, and the avoidance of certain illnesses that come with that. And it just, for me, it felt like it completely missed the point. It was a gorgeous, you know, blue sky, sunny day. The whole place was a really beautiful natural environment. And they've got a sign up there that shows you in a real view, kind of, this is the lake you're looking at, and these are the paths that you can see. Um, and the reasons that they think you might want to go is so that you can avoid disease, you can uh, help with weight management and associated illnesses. Again, kind of missed the point. So people prefer the things that they want over the things that they don't. Um, the final point, those first four points that about making the messages as emotional as possible, about um, uh, really enforcing the short-term benefits because that's what's head-turning, 
telling people what they'll definitely get over the things that they may or may not get in the future, uh, and also painting the things that people want rather than the things they don't want. Those are kind of what I, I would refer to as the desire code. These are what makes things desirable. But there's one final uh, part of the jigsaw, and that's about making stuff really easy. Again, this is, this is something that you guys do all the time. Um, every year you'll see the, the headlines that say, not enough people have been for their flu jab. Obviously, you know, people don't realise that the flu is like the biggest killer in the UK and so many thousands of people die from it every winter um, and that the at-risk people are and then they list them all out and all the potential added complications and so on. And they say, we're obviously not scared enough of flu. Um, but they don't make it, it's, it's, it's true, we're not scared enough of flu because you know, I've had flu and, and die from it, so obviously. Um, but it's not just that, it's the way that some of these things are done. They, you, you'll get a letter from the doctor saying, come for your flu jab. And I'll pick it up at maybe half six on a weekday when I get home. And I think, oh, I'll ring and do my appointment. So I put it in my bag and then I actually carry it around in my bag for about three or four weeks. Because I forget to get it out in the day because there's no need for me to get it out in the day. That, that kind of few seconds extra it takes me to even think about it is just beyond me. Then it gets so tatty and I end up going away somewhere and I think, you know, I need to rid my bag of all the junk and then it ends up going from that bag into a carrier bag of stuff that I need to sort out at some point because I've just decluttered my bag and it ends up there for a few more weeks. And then I see the headline that says we're nearly out of vaccine, um, but also we're halfway through the winter already. And I think, well, I haven't had flu already and if everyone else has had their vaccine, well, chances are I'm going to be all right. So again, it's just about making it easy enough for people to, uh, to access. Um, I don't know if, um, I, perhaps not really clear from my bio, I used to be an athlete, I was, um, I was a bike rider, I actually got good enough to join the world class performance programmes in track cycling um, back in the, from 99 to 2004, so I was on the Great Britain and Wales track cycling team. Uh, and aside is that I used to get really asked, I used to get asked really great questions about all the times um, and the experiences, the places I visited, the people that I knew and so on. Um, but since the British team got really good, I only got asked, you know, Chris Hoy, Hasn't he got amazing legs? And last week, as a, I, I'm sure it was a joke, someone said, do you know Lance Armstrong, do you know where I can get in gear? Um, Chris Hoy tweeted recently, said that he gets asked two questions now. Those are, do you know Tom Daly, and do you know where Tom Daly lives? So these mm. things do go around. Um, but I used to ride a bike competitively, and I literally just stopped in 2004. And I, but I do regularly get asked, do you still ride a bike? And the answer is sometimes. Um, I, will, I will ride a bike sometimes on a really nice sunny day. I'll think, you know what? I just need to go out for, for a quick spin. I'll go to the shed, I'll get the bike out, I'll get the other half to get the spiders off it first. Um, and while I'm out, I'll think, I remember, I remember now why I used to enjoy doing this so much. Uh, I need to go out on this more often. I will wheel the bike into the house, leave it in the hallway, from where I am tripping over it all the time. So I'm more likely to go out on it. I will actually ride that bike then maybe every couple of days for a few weeks. And then something will happen, I'll go away for a week and the other half will be sick of tripping up over it and he'll shove it back in the shed, at which point I don't touch it for months. Um, and I actually measured the gap between my hallway and the shed and it was about 18 seconds. Take off, the, obviously, the, uh, the time it takes to de-spider a bike that's been in the shed for a few months, which is quite considerable. Um, but that gap is 18 seconds. And that is the difference between me doing something and not doing it. So again, let's come back to... Uh, how can you make it really easy for people to access? We've got services in the UK where you go and you see a GP, the GP makes a referral, you end up having to ring up for an appointment, the person then books you in for an induction, and you have to fill in a further form and interview, you get sent back to your GP because there's a complication they haven't thought of, you get another letter back, you, you might end up with 10 steps before you actually put a, set, a pair of trainers on and do a workout. So, you know, there's lots of things that we do that aren't really making it easy for people. And this is a, kind of a final thought, I guess is um, those first four points that I talked about making stuff really desirable but also you want to make it as easy as possible. Um, I'm a big fan of the late Steve Jobs of course and uh, I'm not suggesting that anyone's a bozo, those are his words, um, but I do really like these kind of quadrants and so on. Obviously we want to make stuff as desirable as possible but we want to make it easy too. So that's my, my final point is things got to be simplified. Thank you very much. Any questions? Fantastic. It's not going to make me stop smoking, unfortunately. <laughs> Anybody got any questions for Denise? You're right, this is the hardest to start. <laughs> <laughs> no one? Yes? Um, I've recently done a course in gamification, and actually, they're talking about um, one of the examples that we have to do was to envisage a system where you can make people healthier in the time. 
Have you ever thought of using anything like that yourself? Yeah, I have. I've, and I've been, been doing some discussion with NHS Choices recently. Um, there's, there's a really great example that NHS Choices have got. Again, it's, it's focused on men, but it's a football app that you can get. And it's, 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 it's freely downloadable if you want, want to get it. Um, and you pick your football team, your favourite team. And then you, you kind of become a player of that team. And by doing certain behaviours and working your way through a set of challenges, you can increase your transfer value which is a completely arbitrary number, but people want to push the score up as hard as they can because they want to contribute to the overall ranking of that maybe Liverpool Football Club or whichever one that they've decided they want to be. And you can gain extra points by doing things like watching a two-minute video about oral health or something like that. You might not even want to pay attention to it. You might go off and put the kettle on while it's on, but you will go through the process because you want the points and little bits of stuff might just drip in. There's some really good stuff. Um, uh, that say NHS Choices are putting some really great stuff out there, yeah, that does a lot in there. And, and there's more coming as well. Thanks, Denise, that was excellent. Um, one of the things I was thinking is, do you think that you could apply the same stuff that you, the same principles of trying to persuade one person to, to improve, to trying to um, get an organisation to improve? Yeah, I, I believe actually that these kind of key principles can work across any behaviour. So if you're a line manager trying to change the behaviour of a member of staff, it, again it comes back to the why would you? And you just want to give people a, a good enough personal reason, you want the benefits to be felt straight away, or, or at least some of the, you know, at least immediate feedback. Um, you want to know that if I put this effort in, there'll definitely be a reward, it's not an if and maybe. Um, and you want them to work towards something that they want rather than away from a beating or, you know, if you don't do this, we're going to demote you or we're going to sack you or something like that, you know. After. So I think those kind of things do, do translate. What I've put up here, though, it's not, I wouldn't suggest that we ignore all the other stuff, um, but this is just about headlines, this is about the first points that you make. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Is there any evidence around um, the sustainability of paying people? I wonder whether, yeah, that's, that sounds great. Give me 20 quid a, a, a week and I'll, for the next three months, and I'll lose whatever I need to lose. And then, uh, you know, and I'll, take, I'll, so I'll take that cash, and then when I'm done, you know, I'll just get back again. Yeah. There's, there's, limit, there's limited, um, limited evidence, and there's actually it's a very contentious issue that in London there's a couple of PCTs have been paying people to quit smoking. So you could. <coughs> You turn up, you'd have the uh, smoke alizer test to check the uh, carbon monoxide levels in your breath, and if you passed it, you'd get a payment so many weeks for four weeks. But of course, it could be gamified in that people could just make sure they didn't have any for two days, and then they could still pass the test. Um, and yeah, you want people to really want to quit rather than about paying people. So yeah, I'm not a massive fan of paying people, I'm just saying that we're wasting so much money giving people stuff they don't want. Um, that field agent thing, you know, if we could say to people, we just want to get in the habit of using a local facility, we're going to pay you a £5 a visit for the first 20 visits. After that, you're on your own, but hopefully by then you'll have worked out that you really like it. Um, it is something that I wouldn't uh, object against. Any more? Fantastic. Oh, yes. Andrew. So, how can we stop challenging working then? <laughs> <laughs> we need to apply the why would you question, so we need to give a really damn good reason why she would want to do that. Um, Again, make it really personal, not just say what everybody else does or what a certain select, an imaginary uh, group of the population would want to do. Um, you know, we'd have to make you want to feel it. We'd have to light a fire under you and make you say, I have to do that. I have to be, and it has to be good enough to put up with the pain of doing it. Yeah. Not pretend this stuff, so, um, you know, it feels good to do sometimes. Yeah. Okay. We should talk. We'll find out what my motivation is. Denise, thank you so much. Thank That's you. been wonderful.